I'll slit our bugger. Happy Friday. It has been a seemingly long week. My husband and I were talking about this. With all the snow days, it just sort of feels like it's been a week of Sunday and Mondays. Kind of feels like it's been a struggle to get the week going. And so it kind of is nice that it's Friday, but it feels in absolutely no way, shape, or form like an actual Friday. So it's very surreal. Um, but end of week six, it still is. So, um, and still much earned because it has been a trial of a week. A couple of reminders. So thanks to uh, the chaotic choices of snow days this week. Remember my Monday lab. You will not have lab next week, right? We already did our lab. Um, so you will still have the option to do open labs. Um, today, if you see fit, right, just be careful about the freeze time by the end of the day, and there will be open labs still offered next week, right, which is a change from what we talked about the last I saw you in lab, right, and the reason for which is because my Tuesday lab, right, were denied <laughs> lab this week. So Tuesday labs, we will do our lab per normal this coming week. Heaven help us, right? So make sure that you re-review the materials. I'm sure you all watched them. Um, so you shouldn't have to, you know, go through any of it from scratch. Just sort of re-remind yourself of the Odalith and Scales lab, right? Um, and be prepared to come in and do that stuff per normal on Tuesday. Hey, all of the open lab stuff um, will still be open then through the end of next week. Okay, if you still have an outstanding lab makeup, okay, from being sick, from athletics, perhaps from uh, quarantine at the beginning of the semester, I know we're still burning off some of that chaos. Okay, they need to be taken care of by the end of next week, right? Because <clears throat> the week after that, which is week eight, right, will be our lab exam. So I'll talk more about that next week because um, we're just going to take things in bits, manageable pieces. Okay, so just keep in mind then next week we're doing another split lab. So Monday, okay. We're just going to focus on studying. We will not have lab. And I'll try to remind you of this next week. Hopefully we won't have any more drama like this. Tuesday, right, you will have normal lab. Okay. Any questions about any of that or any other things that may have happened due to the snow day before we get started? Or snow days. <clears throat> Okay, so on, I don't even know, Wednesday, I guess, days almost seem fake at this stage. Um, we have been talking about our chondrichthys. I'm going to find me a roadmap really quick. Okay, so remember we've been talking about this in two parts. Okay, the first part that we talked about were our advances. Okay, we call these upgrades or synapomorphies. Oops. Okay, so remember these are the same traits that sharks and everybody else has, right, um, moving up through. Okay, so these are things that we've added to or improved from our early fishes. Remember agnathans without jaws. Okay, so these were things like paired fins, the addition of jaws, right, increased skeletal support. So these are traits that we expect to see in everybody as we continue to talk about classes, right? Osteophys will have them, birds will have them, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this is the first group of traits we wanted to talk about. At the end of class, then, we started to talk about the unique characteristics. Okay, so what are some things that make chondrichthys as a class special or unique, right? How do we tell our cartilaginous fishes apart from all of the other classes that we have? 
Right, so what makes sharks different from bony fishes or from birds or amphibians? So we have several of these, okay, including, of course, the cartilaginous skeleton itself, the fish's namesake. Okay, these tough and rigid keratin. Remember, keratin is that material in your fingernails. Okay, material that gives them their, like, sticky outy airplane-like fins. We said this was another feature that helps them sort of stay buoyant or floaty in the water in the same way that it, the airplane wings helps them like float through the air. And then we ended up talking about teeth and scales. And this is the last conversation we had at the very end of class. Don't be rude. <clears throat> We talked about how their teeth and their scales are made out of the same material. And so this is a huge improvement, right? So everything's made out of this dentine base, <clears throat> right? And so we talked about sharks having a very unique type of scales, okay? And we kind of remember handling this. It felt like sandpaper on our gloves. It was very tough, okay? And that's because that's made from that dentine base. And lastly, at the very, very end of class, we started talking about teeth okay, and how their teeth was hugely improved. So not only did they get a hingeable jaw that allowed them to tackle okay, bigger and better prey, okay, but they got an improvement from the teeth on our jawless fishes. Okay, so remember our jawless fishes had keratinized teeth, <clears throat> much smaller, much e more easily broken. Okay, so these much larger, reinforced, just like our teeth are. And we also talked about tooth replacement. Okay, so we talked about how if they're taking on much larger, more hardcore prey, the likelihood is these teeth are going to either be damaged, right, or wrenched from their mouths. Okay, and that's just something they're going to have to deal with. Okay, sharks don't kill their prey before they eat them. In fact, we're not going to see that be a standard maneuver really until we get into reptiles. So a long ways away. So when sharks or fishes or amphibians take their prey, remember these are squirming and fighting. So if you're squirming and fighting, the likelihood that if I escape, I'm going to take a tooth. But even if I die, I'm going to take teeth with me. Okay. So remember, they need some sort of way to replace that. And we talked about their tooth replacement set. Right. So we kind of consider this being kind of like a chainsaw. Okay. Where the teeth out here are the oldest teeth. Okay, they're also the longest, right? So these are the ones that are likely. I would kind of imagine these being out by our chin. Right, these are the ones that are likely stabbing and grabbing dinner. Okay, and then, okay, if they're getting pulled out or knocked loose, whatever the case may be, Okay, we have new teeth, so we can kind of imagine these kind of being in by our own gums, like where our teeth are coming from. Constantly being growing, kind of like when we had baby teeth. I know that feels like a long time ago for us. These are constantly being grown up and forward, right, towards that chin. So when they lose a tooth, we can see this here. Right, multiple rows of teeth, so as they lose a tooth, new ones are ready, consistently grown. So within a few hours or sometimes a few days, okay, a new giant angry fish slaughtery tooth is ready to go. Okay, this is where we ended. I was a little worried we had rushed this. I wanted to make sure that we were able to re-review 
Any questions about this before we look at a few more unique characteristics and then specifically the difference between our subclasses? Yeah, good. So her question is, do you ever just shed teeth because they're old and crappy? And so the answer is also yes, right? So if we get one of these teeth at the end here, and if somehow, right, we've gone a while and it's not being ripped out by a very frisky fish, but it has been there a long time, so it's older, it's duller, right? We've chomped many a fish, right? And it's been there a while, so we've gotten many new teeth that are younger and sharper and have grown in behind it. It will still also shed, right? Because this tooth growing process is still continuous. So one way or another, these old snaggly teeth will go. Great question. Anything else? Okay, so we've talked about this one before when we talked about um, life in a water, and of course you've seen it in lab, right? the sensory systems or the very specialized electroreceptors right, that Ampule of Lorenzini, right, named of course after um, the Italian gentleman that found it. Okay, but remember these are just ancillary receptors. So on this side, or my left side here, I have just a zoom in of that sort of like acne or those pits that we saw. Um, on our dogfish a while ago, right? So remember each pit, right, has those nerves or those neurons embedded, okay? And so remember when we looked at them before, right, it's basically a network. And this is what it kind of looked like acne, right, because it sort of spread all over the face okay, and head region. Well, remember, the goal of these electroreceptors okay, is they're detecting body electricity. Okay. This is a very specialized hunting feature. So remember, when we're talking about body electricity, we're talking about things like heartbeats okay, or muscle contractions. So this is a very effective way if I'm hunting you, right, I can hear or feel you, right, I can detect you hiding, right, underneath that coral as your scared little fishy heart goes pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter under there, right? The second you try to sneak away, okay, I can detect your little tail muscles, right, contracting to try to swim the other direction, even if I can't see you. <clears throat> Okay, so even though we'll see other fishes that have electroreceptors, okay, only sharks have this whole system built along their face called the ampullae of Lorenzini. Oh, every time. Correct, yeah. So like we saw the paddlefish, for example, um, on our slides with electroreceptors, so they may still have sections of their bodies that allow them to detect electricity, but it's not going to be a large organ like this. Their vision also has some special features to it as well. And a lot of this has to do with the fact 
that so many of our chondrichthys are predatory. So some features that actually probably will seem familiar, um, if we look at this top feature here, our sharks have a common feature called the tapetum lucidum, which is a big name that just means that they have an extra membrane in their eye that allows it to catch and reflect light. Okay, so eye shine. Okay, so we've seen this before, right? Your cats, for example, have this feature. They have a tapetum lucidum. Okay. But if you're not a cat person, right, so do sheep and deer. Okay, this is what happens when you hit any of those animals with the like lights of your car or a flashlight in the field. Why they look like creepy demon monsters in the middle of the night. Okay. This is what's happening. So if you happen to get into the eyes of these guys, it really is just a metallic surface in the back of their eyes, which is very cool. Um, and what it's doing is in very low light situations, like we see with our shark here, and these are both great white sharks in these images. So in very low light situations, like when you happen to see this with your cat, right? These very metallic surfaces are catching any little amount of light that you have, right, so the flashlight that you're shining on your cat, and it's bouncing that very small amount of light around, so it's basically allowing animals in these low light situations to recycle light, allowing them increased nocturnal vision, which is why animals like cats or deer can be around in the night and do a little bit better or a lot better than we can, because we suck at night vision. It's not great for humans. But our eyes don't do this, right? Okay, so some, several, in fact, particularly predatory chondrichthys have this, right? In addition, okay, most sharks have several additional layers of eye protection. Right, so anytime that you're going to stick your face in, right, because their face is their main weapon, your eyes become very vulnerable. Okay, and since the eyes on these guys are a major hunting feature, right, and survival feature, okay, here we're seeing some key processes to make sure that when you shove your face in something that's likely going to fight back. Okay, how do we make sure that these high-risk, high-energy compounds of our body are not going to get damaged instantly? Okay, so we have two features. The second one is what I have demonstrated here. Okay, the first one is called the nictitating membrane. You've probably also seen this before. This is also common in things like frogs and cats. Okay, so if you've ever kind of snuck up on a cat while it's sleeping and it gives you that creepy look where it looks like its eyes are definitely open, but it has like that extra eyelid like halfway across. Everybody kind of know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you kind of have that, are you sleeping or not, you creepy little demon monster. Okay, I'm a cat person, but I can agree that these things are weird. Okay, they actually do have an extra eyelid. Okay, and that extra eyelid is called the nictitating membrane. And so it's shown here as well. Okay, it's this extra pink layer here. Okay, so that's why it always shows is like mostly covering the eye. So this extra eyelid comes up. Okay. When these predatory animals, for lots of reasons, but in this case, when these predatory animals are going in for a murder bite. Okay, so in this case, when the shark is going in for its kill bite, that extra membrane is going to come up over our cornea, okay, which is that front part of your eye, right, because if that gets scratched, or worse, okay, that's where light has to pass through, right? That's where your vision is passing through. So if that gets messed up, 
So there's not a lot you can do, right? I don't know if anyone's ever had their eye scratched before. It's, it's absolutely terrible, right? Your eye doesn't stop watering. Your vision can get per permanently messed up. And I'm sure that shark eye doctors are pretty few and far between, okay? So they're pretty much hosed. This is the same thing that we see for this rolling back to white idea. So that's the image I have over here in case we needed more nightmare fuel to start the day. So what we end up seeing with other sharks then, and this is again a great white I have here, is right before the shark goes in for its kill bite, or any of this chondritic feast, as they literally roll their eyes in the back of their head. Right? So this has to be a last minute maneuver because I can now no longer see. Okay, but the key here, and so they can do this much, they have more eye mobility, eye muscles than we do. Okay, so they can literally move their cornea up away into the back of the skull. Right? So what we're exposing here, instead of, get a different color here. Instead of leaving the cornea in the front of the eye, which is where our light passes through and where our vision centers are, we're going to move rude we're going to move this whole area back into the protection of the upper eye socket which will then expose all of this back part or the white of your eye okay, so that's what we see here is the white of the eye being exposed which is called the sclera <clears throat> okay which just means all of the white part of your eye that light doesn't pass through. Okay. Now, is it going to suck if something bites the white part of his eye? Yeah. Yeah, that's going to hurt. It's going to suck. Is it going to ruin his vision, though? No. Right? So here's the big difference. Right? By exposing a part of the eye that vision doesn't pass through, it still allows your eye to be damaged, which would still suck. Right? Not ideal in any way, okay? but it's protecting the vision center of the eye. And since that's the most important part, okay, this technique is still doing its job. That's a great question. So the question is, um, with the nictitating membrane, are uh, sharks or organisms still able to see any? Um, and the answer is it does depend, right? So they do have some control over how far up um, these membranes come over their eyes. Um, so for like the middle of a, like a predatory maneuver, not very much because they would close that membrane as much over their eye as possible. But you're right in that usually these membranes do not close completely over the eye. Okay, any other questions? Dr. Arnett, uh, so the rolling back the rolling the back is for protection from the prey? Yes. So basically to make sure as a prey is fighting back um, that they can't slap or bite or poke them in the eyes. Okay. Like remember everything's fighting when they're still like biting them or whatever. Dr. Arnett. Yes, ma'am. When their mm -hmm. eyes roll back, will the nictitating membrane still come down over it? So, no, right? <laughs> you would use one or the other here. <clears throat> so, you would use the nictitating membrane just to cover the, uh, the uh, cornea, right? Like we see in the image here. Or, right, you would roll the eye back. Right, because once we roll that eye back, there's no 
no real benefit to using the membrane anymore because that cornea is out of the way. And the goal here, one way or the other, is to really protect that cornea, right? Protect that area where that light's going to pass through under all costs. Okay, really great questions. Okay, anything else? Make sure I give them a hot second to unmute if they need it. Okay, shiny. Okay, just as a reminder then, right, our chondric fees have a specific subset of systems they're using for buoyancy. So we've talked about this tangentially, right? But we want to make sure that we have it all summarized and clear. So we have our caudal fin. Oh, rats a frazzle. There we go. Okay, what you remember is heterocircle. Hetero meaning different, right? So our lobes are different sizes. So we can see that in this top panel here. So my top lobe in this case is quite large. And my bottom lobe in this case is quite small. Okay, so remember with any caudal fin, this is still going to give me thrust. I can imagine if I switch this. Right, I'm still going to get my forward movement, that's thrust. Okay, but as I swish this, okay, because that top lobe is so much bigger, okay, I'm going to specifically get sort of a downward angle movement as well when I push that water, right? Okay, and that's one of the keys here. Because I'm also getting lift okay so that dual benefit of thrust and lift okay that buoyancy right lift is another term for buoyancy is unique to the chondric phase we won't really see that anywhere else okay we all of course are very familiar with that fatty liver Okay, this is just using the law of biomolecules to its benefit, right? We all remember fondly handling our first liver, okay? And this was a very unique liver now that we've handled four different kinds, right? Our lamprey, our hagfish, our shark, and now our uh, Mexican gray perch. And this one was ushi, gushi, right? Oily, it was much lighter. Right, compared to the denseness of particularly our fish liver, which was the other next largest. Okay. And so this is just using the idea that lipids float right, on water. It's a very nonpolar molecule. Right, so even though our sharks are quite large, okay, this feature, this organ, is giving them lift. Okay, and then we had just added, right, the way that their fins are designed. Okay, my handwriting aside being atrocious. Okay, so remember we had these stiff keratin-based fins. Right, and we said that they kind of stuck out like airplane wings. Okay, so we can really see that here. And we remember that when we handled our dogfish. Okay, these were much stiffer. 
Okay, from being reinforced with all that keratin. Okay, so we can see how this is also going to give us that float, right? Keep us afloat in the water column in the same way that those airplane wings, right? Keep airplanes afloat in the air. Okay, this feel okay? Okay, so these are all things we've talked about before. We just wanted to make sure we brought them together right, and summarized those ideas very clearly. Ooh, not with the erasing. Okay, any questions about the unique characteristics, right? So remember, those are for all of class chondrichthys. Okay, so how would I identify or define all of the cartilaginous fishes together as a group? Okay, so then remember... Our last job, never could talk and write, there we go, is to look at the two subclasses that were underneath class chondrichthys. Okay, so remember we had two of these. And we want to say, all right, how could we Knowing what we know, okay, so they have to have all of these unique characteristics because they belong to class chondrichthys, right? So we have all the synapomorphies and all the unique. Okay, shiny, okay. But there's two subclasses for a reason, okay? So... What then, as our final task within class chondrichthys, are the things that make two different subclasses? Okay, so that's the question we want to ask ourselves here. So for subclass elasmobranchii, Okay, remember that's our sharks, skates, and rays. Okay, what makes them their own subgroup of cartilaginous fishes? And why are they separate than our rat fishes and chimeras? Okay, the weird face people, fishes, whatever. Okay, and why are they in their own group? So what separates them? Okay, if they have all these things together, what puts them apart? So, great question. So the question is, do the unique characteristics and the upgrades exist in each individual or in the class as a whole? Okay, so the answer should be both. Okay, there will always be exceptions. There's always like one weird fish, right, that's going to have to get put somewhere. But overall, okay, what we've done here is define a list of things that should represent the group, okay? And each individual you encounter, and certainly anybody I'm ever going to put on a test, okay, should represent each of those things. All right, so if we were to pick great white shark, right, that's an individual, okay, that belongs in this class. So we could list all of these things for the class, chondrichthys, but I could also take great white shark or lemon shark, right, so individuals, 
And if I were to list those traits, they should be the same. Okay, any other questions before we head on and look at what's what makes class elasma branchii who they are and how they differ from our rat fishes? I really wish I'd had the balls to name. Who names a group of rat fishes? Okay, so let's take a look at this. And we're going to start with subclass elasma branchii because that's going to be the more familiar group to us, right? Those are our sharks, skates, and rays. I still remember, okay, we're still under class chondrichthys. Okay, so these have all of the unique features we just talked about. They have cartilaginous skeletons, tooth replacement, okay, all of that business. Okay, plus they have all of our advances over the agnathans, okay, right, the upgrades or synapomorphies. Okay, so the only thing we're doing here is to say, okay, well, if they're a subclass and there's more than one subclass, there must be something additional okay, or special that's separating them. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. And what makes them unique from the other subclass, the holocephali? Right? Remember the holocephali, the weird face or weird heads? Okay, those are the ratfishes and chimera. So that's all we're doing is we're adding or asking what are the additional special traits that set them apart from the other subclass. Okay, so as I look at the representatives I have here, I can see a whole bunch just at a glance of those unique and it's anapomorphic upgrades, right? They have jaws. I can look here. See my jaws. No, black doesn't show up on pictures. So we can see those uh, upgrades right from my synapomorphies. Okay, for sure. I can even start to see those teeth whorls. Okay, that's the unique characteristic. So we can see all of this stuff. Right, the key here, we want to hang on to something added. Okay, if we're going to have a new group level, we have to have a new trait, something new to sort them by. Okay, what makes you special? Okay, so that's what we mean by feature the features of their own. Something that separates them from everybody else. Okay, feel intuitive. We all follow where we are taxonomically. Don't want us to sort of get lost in the ether of terms. That's my biggest concern. It can be easy to do. Okay, so let's start by reviewing some terms um, that we haven't used since lab, because this is going to be important as we start separating these groups out. So the first thing we want to do um, is start by um, remembering the definition for an, in, man, an intermittent organ. Okay, so we talked about this back when we dissected our sharks. Okay, so we want to remember what is the purpose of it, so what is the definition, and what are some examples of it? <clears throat>
Okay, what is an intermittent organ? To reproduce which way? And am I going to do internal or external fertilization? First. All right. So this is some sort of feature This is some sort of feature that benefits and eases internal fertilization. Okay. So we nailed all the key points here. And so this is something that's really important, and this is going to help us differentiate, as you might imagine here, species or groups that are going to use internal versus, ex that was a weird tone I just used, versus external fertilization. Okay. So we've seen this once before. <clears throat> What's an example of an intermittent organ we've seen? Phosphorus. All right, so we saw these on the male dogfish. All right, remember these were large um, and pointed pelvic fins on the male dogfish, right, that were used to literally hold and clasp the female dogfish in place and then also insert right, the male gametes into her cloaca, right, so this is going to increase the success and efficiency of internal fertilization, right, rather than just hoping you're well enough lined up that it's just going to work out, okay. What might be some other examples? Are we going to be super adults about like this? We just put a bunch of dashes and I was like, I definitely can't think of that before. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. What do, do we remember what snakes do? <laughs> snakes have what's called a hemipene. Okay, so they actually have a branched or a dual-edged penis, which sounds way more exciting than it actually is. Uh, they can't, like, use both ends at once. Uh, okay, we can think of something like birds, for example. Okay, which still, and so we're commonly at this point, right, used to seeing things like a cloaca, right? But we can make that cloaca swell to a point, which can help it. I find its intended target much easier. Okay, and there are more than these, but this is fine. We can imagine, certainly from the ones that we're more familiar with, okay, how you can get, uh, particularly the sperm, from point A to point B. Great question. So the question is, are intermittent organs exclusively male? I can't think of any that are female off the top of my head. Now, there are some weird situations, like females, for example, and hyenas have pseudopenises. Um, so there are situations where intermittent organs are in both sexes, or the intermittent organs in the males are rendered less effective. But I can't think of a situation where the female has it instead. So seahorses are great, I'm going to go ahead and pop up the socket while we're chatting, um, are a great example. And so the answer is no. And so here's what happens with seahorses, which is super cool. So the males still fertilize the female's eggs, right? So we still have male on female fertilization. They still have 
the intermittent or in most of its external fertilization in most species. But after the eggs are fertilized, what ends up happening is the females pick them up and depending on the species, they'll either stick them to the male, okay, or they're going to put them in a pouch on the female using their tail or mouth, again, depending on the species. Um, so very cool situation. And so it feels very similar, but it's happening post-fertilization. And that's why we say that the male is pregnant, right? Because they're carrying around fertilized young, okay, but they're not fertilized inside the male. Okay, in case you didn't catch it because we were feeling chatty about seahorses, I did put up, it was a great question. I wanted to make sure I got to address it. I did put up the Socrative for you all. Um, we will continue to talk about um, reproduction in sharks because this is a major defining feature on Monday. Hopefully next week will be a much calmer week. Um, while I appreciate breaks, um, this doesn't feel like we got much of a break this week. It mostly just felt like exhausting chaos. Yeah, so <laughs> accident, right? So um, whenever you're done, you're welcome to go. I'm just going to keep talking about hyenas. <laughs> yeah, so the pseudopenis is sort of an accidental issue. So hyenas have a female matriarchy in their system. Um, and as a result, or a side result, the females in hyena society actually have a lot of testosterone in them. Um, so female hyenas are super aggressive, and you are the alpha female if you have the most testosterone. Um, they bully the males, they abuse the males, it's a whole thing. As a result, because female hyenas have so much testosterone, it has changed the structure of their external genitalia. Um, so they end up with sort of this long tube system that is referred to as a pseudopenis um, outside their vaginal canal. It's so bad that females that have their first birth, their offspring often die being passed through the pseudopenis passageway. So it's very hardcore. So the answer is nothing except it's associated with this high testosterone, which does make them more successful in hyena society. Exactly, yes. So very cool. Yeah. <laughs> and you're never going to get me to say no to talking about animals. So. <laughs> you too. Be safe, everyone. Oh, I am 